And I, I want to welcome everybody. What a great crowd today. Um, first and foremost, uh, this is the, I want to invite you guys as friends of the chemistry department to the chemistry department picnic, um, which will be May 23rd in City Park. Um, if you are interested, uh, you don't have to bring like a chemistry or biochemistry major with you, but make sure that you sign up outside the stock room, which is next to the elevator on the first floor. Um, this is our fifth of 18 presentations. Um, it's my distinguished pleasure to introduce Lindsay Polson. Um, and that Lindsay's my uh, research student. And so, <laughs> it's uh, kind of sad there. It's kind of interesting because Lindsay is, is uh, how to describe, very talented in a number of different ways, including, I mean, part of the tennis team is here, her oboe performer is here, she also does Spanish translation. Um, but for me, we've worked together on research, specifically on compost. And this actually started years and years ago where Michael, back over here, everybody stares at him, <laughs> and four other students got together with me over the summer. None of them were Lindsay at that particular point. <laughs> but no, no, wait, just let, let, let the story unfold. So what happens here is the science is not a lonely sort of thing, but it's an endeavor that you like to do with other people to, for support, help, scientifically. This four, or this fivesome back in the day um, worked very hard and had several excellent presentations. And the Lindsay and Shelby came along oh, two years ago and started showing very much interest in, in working on a variety of different projects with me and started them in the, on the yeast project. And at that, about that same time, was working well with Dr. Mike Lars at UW Fox on a composting project as well. And it became clear getting to know Lindsay that meshing together the compost project and her passion for sustainability and slugs would work out really well. And then, lo and behold, Elena Ribbon shows up with expertise in yet another field, which is, which is nitrogen metabolism. And so we went from one kind of group of yeast to another group, um, all working together towards, you know, very hard towards excellent science. Um, and so it, it's just been a tremendous pleasure to work with, uh, with, with Lindsay. And uh, Lindsay's going to be uh, working as a research veg chemist for a while while she is finding that right spot for environmental policy. Um, and I'm proud to say that we're like this close to getting this published. All we have to do is answer a couple reviewer comments. Um, and most of the, half the data you'll see today is, is going to be published and the other half will wait for another student to help finish it perhaps. Without further ado. Thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, microbial diversity of <coughs> nitrogen fixing gene abundance in backyard food waste composting systems. So, as the grass is finally green, now that we have lightning, and there are no more snow piles, you might be thinking about your garden and juicy tomatoes for the middle of summer, and part of that, you're like, oh, what do you add? Do you add fertilizer in your garden? So you might look at the package, and there's nitrogen, and there's phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen going into sort of that cellular growth, your phosphorus helping some of those cellular processes, and then potassium more indirectly helping those reactions. So all the growth is going on. But riddled with your fertilizer are some highly industrial chemicals that go into the process and a lot of energy inputs that, you know, maybe during World War II we revolutionized agriculture, but there's some negatives to it too and a lot of ammonia release into the atmosphere. So as an alternative, we look at compost as a soil amendment which in this case has two primary components. So when we think about it, it's typically brown, and you think carbon, and green, you think your nitrogen sources. So carbon being the primary energy component and nitrogen being more of the uh, growth factor. You're getting your uh, nitrogen for your DNA and your genetic materials, amino acids going all up to structure. So, but everything's important. And that's why having a balance is important too. And as chemistry majors, as students at Lawrence, we understand this. And maybe <laughs> yours is an 18 study to one relaxing, but I don't know what mine really is. It might be that. But if you have too much relaxing, you might melt into the couch watching Netflix or crumble as a stale cookie by studying too much. So therefore, compost also needs this ratio. Typically, 
a good balance would be about 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. But that really depends on what types of carbon sources you're using, what types of nitrogen sources, because they all vary based on the surface area that's available and uh, how much is there, if there's more carbon in something or less. But generally, too much nitrogen, you get, like I said, ammonia released. Too much, uh, well, or N2 gas, the nitrogen gas too. And that all goes up into the atmosphere, uh, causing some issues, as we all know. But if you have too much carbon, which get broken down as an energy source, um, you don't have enough nitrogen to sort of get things going and produce enough heat to fulfill the entire process. So therefore, let's take a look at the pile. So, as I said, green materials, nitrogen. You ate an apple for lunch, maybe. That can go in the pile. Your eggs for breakfast, put those eggshells in there. Bananas, your Halloween pumpkin, maybe, you know? And then you get to layer it with your carbon sources. So, hey, things like hay, leaves, wood chips, whatever it may be that you like best for your carbon. <laughs> and then we start to form what you typically think of as a pile. So, like I said, we're going to layer it. So you have nitrogen and the carbon, nitrogen, carbon, and that sort of creates a convection current. So you're creating heat through uh, some of the reactions that are taking place that we will talk about. <laughs> but also you need the balance of moisture, because moisture is really important to some of those interactions that are going on in the pile and to pH. And heat, because that's also helping this process of that current that's keeping the pile going. And aeration, because oxygen, really, this compost pile is all about redox. So you're oxidizing, reducing, that's making energy in this. And that might sound complicated, but there's, you might have this in your community, but there's an entire crazy community in this pile of microbes. Oh yes, <laughs> microbes. <laughs> So how are we taking the nutrients that are in all these food products and these carbon sources and breaking them down, making them available to plants? Yeah, that's those microbes. So these little guys you're seeing here are bacteria, fungi, someone's rendition of them, I love it. And so bacteria, if you think about one gram of compost, which is really not much, that's 100, to 100 million to a billion bacteria, which is quite insane. And Fungi. So the bacteria initially do a lot of that work to break down the soluble materials where the fungi are your primary components for breaking down cellulose, so think plant cell walls, plant structure, and lignin also involved in that, so the woody things. And they both together um, work as a team, but bacteria tends to make up about 90% of your microbial community, whereas fungi makes up about 10%, but there's a few other things in there. So and sometimes nematodes. <laughs> so how do these microbial communities interact to actually produce compost? Well, they're very temperature dependent. There are a lot of factors. As we saw while we were making the st structure of the pile itself, you have different phases of the compost that are dependent on what's there, what time, how much temperature is produced. So initially, um, the, you'll have certain bacteria and fungi that are populating the pile that survive better at these temperatures and they're more active between uh, typically like three, up to 50 degrees Celsius is the change. So um, that'll typically last a few days and then you get a thermophilic cycle. So a lot of those mesophilic bacteria uh, that are populating the pile initially are killed off once you reach higher temperatures, typically between 50 and 70 degrees. Above 70 degrees you kill off a lot of helpful bacteria that are um, important to your pile, so some of those really high temperature composting aren't actually helpful for the microbial uh, diversity in the pile in your breakdown. So this could go through a series of mesophilic and thermophilic, but eventually will settle down into a maturation and cooling phase, um, where that's where you would identify it with what you typically think of as compost, because it'll start to get that brown material that you can feel in your hand that's more like soil. And that can last months, so it's a longer process. And so you think about your backyard, and not we're not looking at municipal scale here because I want it to be accessible to you, and we're thinking about what individuals can do uh, to interact with um, the food waste that they're producing so you don't have to ship it miles away to a different facility. So what people do as a typical step is 
they might start with a static bin. So that's just sitting in your backyard. You might have constructed it out of wood or an old bin or whatever you want, as long as it can sit there and you can fill it with carbon and nitrogen and your food scraps or whatever, coffee grounds, uh, broom ash, we'll talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> so those sit there and they might be less aerated because you typically leave it there. Sometimes people shovel it up, get some oxygen in. And another version of that is just like something that you can turn, so it'll introduce oxygen into the pile. Or something like a windrow, which you might see down at the garden if you ever come visit. Um, <laughs> so that's a longer pile. You're still constructing it, like you saw earlier in the slides, with your uh, form of layering. But it typically looks like a trapezoid, just a little less even. <laughs> and those, depending on the manpower you have, or if there's a blower or different pipes to provide aeration, um, that can be static or semi-aerated in the sense that you might have more oxygen introduced if it's flipped on a regular basis, but a lot of times it can just sit there and it still composts just a little bit differently. That's kind of what we wanted to explore. So we picked three different systems with a collaboration with UW Fox Valley and then using uh, one pile here at Lawrence University. So the UW Fox Valley is an aerated windrow, meaning that it's a regularly turned windrow that used actually an aerator. Um, so it's the most technical pile in this case. And that takes uh, food scraps, so diverse um, arrangement of food and inputs from St. Joe's Food Pantry. The banana geobin was just straight bananas and uh, leaves. So, or hay. I, I think it was hay. I can't remember. <laughs> And the slug semi-aerated windrow is made up of food scraps from the dining hall here at Lawrence University. Also, uh, coffee grounds from fruit awakening, sex, and at this point when we took the data, we were also getting fruit mash from Stone Arch. So, a wide variety of inputs, but it's semi-aerated because it's only turned very infrequently, maybe on a monthly basis, so there's less oxygen being introduced in that pile. So, as we started looking at those piles, there are some questions that came up and kind of guided the sense of our research, which does the type of compost bin uh, affect the microbial communities that are present? So sort of looking at the different microbiomes in different composting systems. And then from there, with uh, Relina Ribbons here on campus and who had studied uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria and soil, um, we could start to ask ourselves, well, are these same uh, communities present as nitrogen is such a huge component of compost, can we find them in compost rather than just um, long-term soil communities? So can we identify them more so, so that we can look at what's doing this nitrogen fixation process if we are indeed finding it in compost? So in order to do that, we took compost samples and got genetic material from them. And from that, we can do two different types of analysis that can tell us who's in the pile or what's in the pile, fungi and bacteria particularly, and use quantitative polymerase reaction, a different method, to tell us how much, giving us putting everything together for a more complete microbial community analysis. So in order to get the compost, we did what I'd like to call a compost smoothie. <laughs> Thanks to some Bio 130 students who helped me out and also Elizabeth Bridgewater. <laughs> So sampling from the pile, which if you imagine the windrow um, at this point, you have a pile that might be multiple feet across, so we would try to find the center of the pile, and there are many different zones in the pile that have different oxygen because you have different inputs in different areas. So we try to go, sometimes piles can be two to three feet high, depending, um, so we try to go at least a foot down if it wasn't frozen. And dig out about a 15 milliliter beaker of compost. And from there, we take from two different spots. So we get each of the zones. And also temperature, because that's giving us that thermophilic cycle, if you remember. And we blend it up, because you need a homogenous sample in order to really look at what you have in each of the locations. And I promised we tried not to be worm assassins, because there were lots of worms. <laughs> and then in order to keep the uh, DNA from degrading or the genetic material from degrading, we stored it at negative 20 uh, so that we could still look at the time points without the compost decomposing more at room temperature 
throughout the process it took us to uh, carry out the research. And there was some moisture analysis, which if you have further questions about that, you can ask me later. So once we got our sample, we want DNA from that compost. In order to do that, you have to do a more complicated process, which also had some helpers for. And that involves, so that, imagine that compost sample that was in the hands, weighed out 0.1 grams, 0.1 to 0.2, depending. And you have to break open the cell, because that's what's containing your genetic material. And also in there is a lot of structural components, like proteins. So you have to filter those out first. So protein removal. And then DNA precipitation. So what you're doing is a series of washes so that eventually you can get to this point where there's a little filter that'll find the DNA. You can wash everything else out and then one more time it's still sticking on there and you have a different wash that allows you to just wash your DNA through. So all you're left is with, this is an exaggeration, but probably 11 to 40 nanograms of DNA. So that is your genetic material that can lead to a lot of other analyses. And that can tell you what specific bacteria uh, species are present, what fungal bacteria is present, and potentially nitrogen fixing, fixing bacteria. And that's through next generation sequencing, which you technically ship off to another lab, which is helpful. Also, what we did um, here at Lawrence was quantitative polymerase chain reaction. So that's telling us the how much of bacteria, fungi, and nitrogen fixing bacteria. So we can contrast the two. And both those involved, so here's our isolated DNA. That's not just a fancy underlying. <laughs> 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 so using primers, which are a known piece of DNA, we're able to take this DNA we've isolated from the compost and through a series of heating and using that known DNA that's specific to fungi, bacteria, and nitrogen fixing bacteria, we can get to know through this process uh, of amplifying, so taking a little bit and making a lot, we can use that DNA and we have a lot more of it to work with for doing analysis like NGS or the next generation sequencing that tells us how much or tells us which species or quantitative polymerase reaction, chain reaction, which is the quantitative version of this. So you amplify it in order to learn some more information. So once again, see, we've got those primers that are very specific to which one we're looking for. And in this case, we're adding this crazy thing called cyber green. And I promise this isn't like Green Lantern, but it's pretty cool too. So <laughs> what we're doing is pairing something that we can, that intercalates in the DNA. So you're uh, pairing a fluorophore, which is a visualization method, with your DNA so that they are um, paralleling the information so that when you know how much fluorescence you have, you know how much DNA you have. Sneaky, sneaky. So all of these things are combined in these tiny little tubes and there are 96 of them in one plate. That's a lot. This is maybe 20 microliters, uh, typically for one reaction. And it's mixed up so you don't have little layers, so it's all being tested. And that's going through that same heating process so that you're multiplying the DNA. And what we'd see is something like this, which looks crazy, but what you're seeing is over 40 cycles, so 40 of those heating and uh, repeating to get more DNA. You're seeing more DNA be here because this is showing fluorescence, which is proportional to your DNA. Therefore, if you're seeing more fluorescence at an earlier time point, you're able to you have more DNA present because that's proportional fluorescence is able to be detected because there's more of that in your DNA, if that makes sense. Um, and there would be less DNA with less concentration of your DNA because you wouldn't have as much fluorescence associated. So it would show up in latter cycles of that amplification process. So therefore, once you put in a sample DNA that you don't know the concentrations, these would all be known concentrations, we can then use, based on um, some calculating, based on how much of the sample was put in, we can see, well, where does this fall within our known concentrations of fluorescence that we've already established, telling us how much DNA specifically of fungi or nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which we are going to focus on, um, is in the compost for each sample at each time point. So with those two, we can get at our microbial community. 
who specifically are we looking for? Well, with that sequencing data, we get more than 2,000 species for one time point, which I don't think you would enjoy looking at on a figure. <laughs> so we look at more of things that have common characteristics but still tell us a lot about the different time points. And so therefore, we lean more towards using class. So if we think about like the, if you have a bunch of different majors at Lawrence, this would be like the chemistry majors were all very different, but still are chemistry majors and share some commonalities compared to the, the English majors. And more species level, where you've got a lot more individualization, like they might play oboe or garden or things like that. <laughs> so we'll start with the fungal classes, because that's the less developed data. The fungi tend to break down, as I said, the cellulose and lignin in the compost. So the three main classes that we noticed were Saccharomyces, which is yeast, uh, that you might find in a beer if you go to the VR this afternoon, um, which does fermentation and some of your uh, secondary metabolites, so that's speeding up different reactions that are going on in the pile, and Mucoromycotina, which it's really cool because it's predatory fungi, but <laughs> also survives on decaying organic matter, like leaf matter, so it tends to be at lower temperatures. So with the Fox Valley pile, which is the most technical of the piles, we see in yellow, that's above 50 degrees. I know 47 isn't, but it's like a later thermophilic phase still sort of transitioning. So that's showing you where that thermophilic change is when we reach that yellow section that I showed you earlier. So what I really want you to focus on are the two main components playing here, the two main classes, uh, which are the Eurotiomycetes, which are coming in right with that, you see them growing as the mucoromycotina is starting to populate less of the pile. So we have a lot more of the Eurotiomycetes um, indicating that that's likely a thermophilic fungi, or a class of fungi, and the mucoromycotina is more of that mesophilic um, carrying out piles, uh, breakdown of lignin and cellulose. And the interesting thing is, Sorry for the color change, but your TMICDs in this case is the green, but we still see, even though this pile gets to, doesn't reach a full thermophilic phase, um, it only reaches 35 degrees Celsius, we still see your TMICDs right after that peak in temperature populating much more of the pile than we do the um, Saccharomyces. And this is an interesting change where we have a different pile with different inputs and the mesophilic fungi that's populating the pile is a completely different species, but it's it was at the beginning and this first time point makes up 95% of the pile, which is wild. Whereas banana, which has very low diversity of inputs, is showing um, once again the Eurotiomycetes and the Mucoromycotina, which is also from UW Fox Valley, so that would be an interesting thing to look at further is, um, is there more selective microbiomes for even locations within the same city. Um, but Eurotiomycetes is populated. This pile is odd because it never reaches that full thermophilic state either, but and it has lower temperatures. Um, but it's pretty even throughout. You have more of that uh, thermophilic bacteria in an odd ratio at that point. So the three we see are, like I said, the Saccharomyces, the mesophilic stage for slug, that was the only one, the Eurotiomycetes, which is thermophilic for Fox Valley in slug, and then the Mucoromycotina. And we might wonder, why is that one not in slug? It could be due to a different microbiome, due to different inputs. I mean, slug is the only one with some of the um, brew mash and coffee grounds, so good things to look at. And then we get into bacteria, which are making up, like I said, 90% of the microbes in the pile. So this is where we really focus our energy. So my, some of the main classes you might want to focus your eye on are gamma proteobacteria and alpha proteobacteria, being methane, methane oxidizers, um, potential nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, alpha proteobacteria being phototrophic, so photosynthesis, right? <laughs> Clostridia bacilli. Different pathogens, but they also have some different functions, and cyanobacteria also phototrophic. So watch out. So with Fox Valley, um, our bacteria classes are marked for you, especially those two temperature points um, at 63 and 65 degrees. 
where you see bacilli really populating the pile in the earlier phases, so mesophilic, and then um, starting to drop off right after the thermophilic phase. And the gamma proteobacteria in this nice, beautiful magenta is populating the pile in that maturing and cooling phase. So this is a uh, lengthy time. And in that, these last two phases, there's a particular species called Pseudomonas um, tuomarins, and that's making up 15% and 16% of the pile at that point with a single species, which is fascinating because later on it correlates with some of our data in um, the nitrogen fixation. fixation. So keep your eye on it. Uh, slug, which had no thermophilic phase but did reach some higher temperatures, also shows the bacilli populating the pile much larger in the first initial stages and then sort of getting smaller incrementally and the gamma proteobacteria once again sort of populating much larger in the maturing phase. But there was the presence of uh, Trenotophomonas, uh, I can't remember the last part of the name, which is an antimicrobial resistant bacteria, which is a little bit concerning that we might not be reaching the like optimal 60 to 70 degrees Celsius temperatures that would limit the presence of that gamma, gamma proteobacteria, a specific one that could be harmful, um, a har more harmful pathogen. But it depends on if it's harm harmful for the plants necessarily. So we have to look more into the species. Whereas our banana pile, because of the lack of microbe diversity in inputs, also has sort of more of a balance in the microbes. And it's populated by the bacillus in the last stage, which is unusual. Um, so it doesn't really show the same composting cycle, sort of indicating to me, based on the other two of the piles, that we might not be getting the same strength of uh, potential for nitrogen fixation in that pile and for helpful microbial communities being formed through the thermophilic stage. So with that in mind, there also may have been this tiny like, thermophilic stage that we didn't catch because this happened in under 48 days, which is really short amount of time. And there was a presence of Pseudomonas thermobacter right before which is like a little suspicious that maybe there was a tiny thermophilic phase and then faded off quick, but there's no proof, just suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, with our bacterial communities, we had primarily gamma proteobacteria interacting with um, the bacilli, sort of one coming to a close at the end of the thermophilic phase and the gamma proteobacteria populating after the, uh, in the maturing and cooling. And with the banana pile, we have the minimal microbial diversity leading to uh, minimal change in some of those bacterial uh, diversity that's present. And that as we start to think about the piles and where we're seeing the most microbial diversity, we're seeing the Fox Valley, which had regular aeration, uh, encouraging that thermophilic stage of the pile, which seems to be really important if we're looking at certain populations there um, to some of its potential both to eliminate pathogens and to promote nitrogen fixing bacteria. Maybe. Let's take a look. And so we want to focus then on the Pseudomonas tumorans and think, well, is this associated then with the nitrogen fixing bacteria potential of the pile? So there's a lot of challenges in breaking down nitrogen, which I already mentioned in the beginning. I know the Haber-Bosch process Haber, there, <laughs> is very high energy. You're trying to break a triple bond, which is something that bacteria have been doing for thousands of years by themselves without using so many resources and such a high energy process. So can we replace that part of agriculture more with some of that bacterial activity and see what is actually carrying out that process in the compost pile? Specifically, nurse, <laughs> nurse. I called it nurse the first time. <laughs> and there are available materials of um, inorganic nitrogen in the soil. So you might have ammonium ions, and all these are converted through enzymes into nitrite and nitric oxide and nitrate. Nitrate being the most available to plants, but sometimes nitric oxide is converted to uh, the nit forms of nitrogen gas like. Uh, 
I, the dioxygen. So we want it to be available to plants. That's the ideal. But some of it is let off into the atmosphere in unhelpful forms. And that's encouraged if there's extra, <coughs> excess nitrogen in the soil. So all of this is sort of, like I was saying, the redox process of you have your microbes, which are breaking down the carbon for energy. And that's sort of a uh, hydrolyzing process. So you're using the moisture to carry out that breakdown. And that's creating both your energy for your cells, so different you'll have carbon dioxide produced as part of it, but that's also releasing some nitrogen gas, but it also makes some of those forms available to plants. In order to do that, there are those enzymes. So we wanted to focus on, well, can we identify NURAS, which is a denitrifier, in, uh, that's a gene that's encoding for enzymes that break down the nitride into nitric oxide and see if we can identify, well, what is specifically doing this in compost? Can we associate some of the species we're seeing with how much? So with the Fox Valley, which is the most unique of all the piles, which is the only one also with the thermophilic stage, we see the NURS, so the high abundance, and this is tenfold difference. So this is each number here on the side would be 10 times more gene abundance. Uh, so we see a huge drop right at that where you see 65, um, and then it shoots up, so we have a lot of nitrogen fixing potential and nitrogen fixing genes um, in that maturing and cooling phase, which paralleled the presence of that Pseudomonas tumorans species that we found earlier. Whereas in slug, we see pretty much stable, and it never reached a full uh, thermophilic stage, so we see it stable throughout, maybe a little bit, um, pretty much the same and as well as the banana bin. So that might introduce to us, well, is aeration really critical to this uh, production of nitrogen vexing bacteria in the compost in the presence of that Pseudomonas species? And potentially others, we want to look further into different Pseudomonas species if it, there are other types of gamma proteobacteria, but that one was definitely the most prevalent in these piles. So overall, we can look at, well, did the type of compost system affect the microbial communities that were present? Yes, but aeration was also really critical to the different types of communities there. And the thermophilic phase and being able to produce that through more aeration was also critical to having the full changes in the cycle and producing the pseudomonas tumorans, which we might associate with the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So the aeration helps facilitate that thermophilic phase, providing enough oxygen to create the heat currents through the pile and release uh, what we need to. So throwing it back to you, you might not need to make a compost pile in your desk drawer, but you have the potential to make it in your backyard or come help us at Slug. But these are just some options to think about as thinking about the health of different compost piles and some alternatives to utilizing fertilizer in your garden because you can sprinkle it on your soil, you can use it in your garden, and we have a lot more to learn about it when it's not on a municipal scale. So if you want to learn more too, you can read the paper if it gets published soon, which it will get published. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Dave, my research advisor, uh, Alina for all the help, uh, Teresa, uh, Dan Martin, Wayne, Stefan, Rosa for support, and all my research helpers, which were a lot. Elizabeth, Molly, Dory, Lini, Joey, Mick, Shelby, Annabelle, and probably some more even touched base with at some point, and then money helps too. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, at least 20 times I ran QPCR, which is two hours, two to three hours running, and uh, probably an hour to two hours set, depending on how fast you get. So, and having it just not work many, many times and trying to fix primers and realizing that, like, there's a lot of Compost itself has so many factors, and then you introduce lab techniques, which have many, many factors. And so realizing that trying again is good, and asking questions is good, and failure is normal. Yes? Is it interesting to compare across the compost files the QPCR data from your Sorry, I'm, I don't know. Maybe you said that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, there the range is right. So for the first pile, the aeration pile, there's the big dip. Then the other ones are all leveled off around mm -hmm. like nine. Yeah. A lot of scale. So. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. The, um, you think that maybe a lot of the neurons is probably in that mesophilic, um, in those different types of mesophilic bacteria. And that's, I think, partially why they're saying, like, at 60 to well, above 70 degrees Celsius, you're losing a lot of the really helpful bacteria. And that, could be part of the reason why we just haven't been saying it for a long time. Because <laughs> no one else has really, we looked at papers and no one else had looked at like nitrogen fixing bacteria, specifically in compost, which is kind of why you think of compost as a plant growth. Uh, and then uh, have you looked at all at how the diversity of the inputs affects the microbial diversity? Because I imagine that that has been mm -hmm. here. Yeah, uh, part of that was, yeah, looking at the systems. I think it would be interesting if we had all uh, the same system with different inputs would be really helpful too. I think we, there's another factor, but composting tends to be a little irregular. But yeah, you have different, your different inputs, like uh, if you use wood chips, you have less surface area available. So everything will clump around what's going to be broken down. So if you have smaller things like sawdust versus a wood chip. Um, your microbes are going to clump around those and the sawdust is more easily broken down but it also has less space for the for the pores so for your gases to form so you get more anaerobic zones and less oxygen there whereas if you have something like a wood chip that breaks down less readily so you have to, it's a much longer process and and so that will def it's all ratio dependent and also how much moisture is there for like some, there are specific species that are dependent on the moisture to hydrolyze some of the bonds and um, take electrons and energy from the carbon sources. So it is very input dependent. Does that answer? We'd have to look into it more. I think it'd be cool to see the same pile with different um, so if you had the chance to either continue your work um, with you know, the resources and time needed or had the chance to uh, do another research project or start over, um, what do you think, how would you, what would be the next step, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's so much more analysis even with what we have that we haven't been able to do. Like, we don't have the carbon-nitrogen ratio specifically for any of the piles, which would tell us a lot more, too, uh, about balance and what you could add to make it more of a better ratio. I mean, and the, as the pile goes along, too, your carbon-nitrogen ratio should decrease so that you have about 10 to 15 carbon to one part nitrogen. So that would be fascinating to see as more of a looking at it like and doing some of these analyses as we went so if you could see if you were like very closely monitoring a lot of these factors like moisture oxygen um, carbon nitrogen ratios in the pile as it went along if you could produce compost and then you could have sampling time points and see if the microbes uh, microbial diversity was different if it was a more regulated pile I think that would be cool but also different types of aeration too like different types of pipes you can put in. Some people do it on pallets. Um, industrial sites tend to use some that will be almost like a turning crank um, aerator that'll like push the compost through at a certain rate of temperature. But I, I'd like to see those and then see if there's a way we could do that 
smaller scale for backyards that would be like you mechanistically problematic. <laughs> Relatable is this to say indoor composting where you have like worm composting, which is the worm composting. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very large bin of worms in the middle of my kitchen right now. Um, <laughs> and so, given that they're not exposed to um, uh, any sort of outside flora or anything, like, do you think there would still be a, a, a large diversity or less diversity with the microbial biome communities? I'd say maybe a little less because you don't have really direct contact with rainwater things. I mean, they say with a lot of indoor piles, you have, uh, in smaller piles, you have less heat retention, so you tend to have to have more insulation for them, but the like, house is different than outside, outside especially. And then you might have more issues with moisture. You probably have to add more water. Um, like too much water, you get anaerobic conditions, but like too little water, you have less you, uh, detriment to your microbial diversity too. And that's one of the things that inside is you don't get any precipitation, so you're just relying solely on your nitrogen sources then. So I'd say you'd need like more water-based nitrogen sources would be my suspicion. Oh, Follow-up question then. Um, yeah. Have you taken into account, or does the location of the slug pile next to the river affect possible <laughs> differences that you're seeing, particularly comparing to the box out? That would be really interesting. I don't really know, but I think likely. I mean, we saw total, I don't know if the the yeast presence in the pile. I think that's probably input dependent. But I mean, the, all of them were a little low on moisture, so I think they could have used more. And maybe we would have even seen more microbial diversity. But I'm sure. I feel like there's definitely a difference in location. We're gonna. I wanted to explore that further too, and like. Like arid climate versus um, very high water, whatever those climates are called, <laughs> and they they have noted a big difference in piles and what you have to do for piles in different places. So if you could write up kind of like a, a guide for composting that's very specific for different locations to help people are doing it on their own. Other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again.